Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! I like to give a little context just for prime our pumps so those who weren't here. You can always listen to all that you missed on my podcast, which is easy to get. And before you leave tonight, I can show you on the phone how to get there. You can go through the church's website, go through my blog. There's different ways to get to it. And I, you know, if you ever do listen to the podcast, you'll notice that most of the time, on purpose, I cut out your questions. I start, I start them and then cut them out and go straight to the answer. Partly because that way you don't feel like you're on the air, but also because it just saves time. And that's why often I repeat the questions. So if Pat asks a question, I might say, it's a good question. You ask, da, 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 da. That's because I'm going to cut that out of the podcast and just repeat it, if that's okay. Um, it also gives you the freedom. You don't have to be that concise in your questions. Some people like to talk more than others and have a two-minute question. Some do it in two seconds, but I cut that out. So if you hear it, it's not because I don't like you. It's because I'm conserving time on the podcast to make it about like an hour and 10 minutes versus 90 minutes. That works that well. But they are there, and I'll encourage you to go back and listen to them. So the very end of chapter 23, this chapter 23 is a lot of woes. Remember the, when I said the prophets say, whoa, whoa, that means judgment's coming. So Jesus went in, he overturned the money changers, temple, uh, money changers tables. He, he cursed the fig tree which is probably means symbolic meaning the temple is done. And then he gives a bunch of woes about how bad they've been. They've killed the prophets. They have done bad things. And the end of chapter 23 says, man, I wish you would have listened. I would love to have had my own people repent. But it's too late. And chapter 24 and some of 25 continues this long, depressing theme that the temple is finished. That's basically all. 23, 24, and 25 all have in common the temple's finished. If I were to add one theme. This next section is one of the most discussed, most confusing, most not read <laughs> sections of the teaching of Jesus. And so I'll do my best to explain this as quick as I can. This is oftentimes called, yeah, sometimes it's called the Olivet Discourse. It's a well-known in Christian scholarship to call it that. He was on the Mount of Olives. It says that in verse 20, uh, 3, 24, 3. So oftentimes this is called the Olivet Discourse. This is one of the sections, and there's not many, in the Gospels where Jesus gives speech and narrative in an apocalyptic vocabulary. And apocalyptic. Those who had my class on Revelation should remember a little bit, I talked a lot about apocalyptic imagery. Apocalyptic imagery is where you use cosmic, inflated terms, hyperbole, exaggeration, good versus evil, light versus dark. And it's talking about the end times. Usually, but so sometimes this is called also, in addition to the Olivet Discourse, the mini apocalypse. Now, he uses apocalyptic vocabulary at different times in his parables, but this is the longest sustained section of Jesus using vocabulary. But technically speaking, he doesn't use, he didn't really get there, the down and dirty, until the end of this narrative. So I'll point it out to you. I'll say, here's an example. He's kind of switched gears. Okay, that's what I'm going to say as an intro. We'll see more as we go along. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have this account, and it's a little different, but they all three have a similar point. And I think Matthew is probably one of the easiest to understand. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, don't you? It's in the negative. Don't you? Do you not? 
Truly I say to you, there will not be left there one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So this is Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple. It is not radical to talk about the destruction of the temple. It's not common, but it's not unique. Other Jews at the time that we have evidence for which we have evidence also critique that, particularly the community at Qumran and different Jewish literature can talk about it. It wasn't widespread. It's just that Jesus is not the only person to talk about it. Having said that, it matters a whole lot that Jesus does, in fact, predict it and why he predicts it. Well, he's already told us why. That is, he thinks it's corrupt. It's supposed to be a house of all nations, prayer, right? But instead, you've turned to a den or a cave of bandits. In other words, you're exploiting the poor people, and you run off to the temple and hide behind and think we're all secure and safe, and God won't judge us. So he's already told us why. Now he's saying it's not going to last. Now, let me say one quick thing about this, and then I'm going to go back to interpreting it. But you need to know this. I think you do. <laughs> Maybe I'll say it and you go, no, I didn't at all. <laughs> Most scholars, well, when I first started Matthew, when I first started out, I said, we do not know when the Gospels are written because they are anonymously written. It doesn't say written by Matthew. The titles came later, and nothing in the document tells us when it was written. We have to surmise when it was written, and there's a lot of reasons why they surmise it when they do. I'm not going to go to all the reasons. I did some of that when I first started the study. That's also my podcast, Matthew, the introduction to the Matthew and the Gospels. But one of the main reasons why scholars date the Gospel of Mark around AD 70, Matthew to around 80, Luke to around 85-ish, and John, most people put around 90. The reason why they put 70, 80s, 90s, roughly, really usually comes down to one single point, and it is this narrative. And it's really verse 2 that you, we just read. That I'm telling you, not one stone's going to be last upon another. The point is, the point is, most scholars historically have argued this is not a genuine prophecy. This is the gospel writer using the voice of Jesus to pretend it's a prophecy, but we all know that's not what happened. What really happened was, these are the Christians, I mean it happened, but these are Christians writing upon this event after it happened. Now, you might ask the question, well, why would they say that? The answer is because they apparently don't believe in real predictions. Well, the yes, Vanna's face is exactly how I feel. Is it conceivable that Jesus was right and he actually could tell a prediction? That's the question to ask. Most scholars historically said no. Well, I find that unconvincing. It's not crazy at all. Even if you don't think Jesus was and is the Messiah, and you worship Satan, if you still put this in context, as I've already done, I said it is not unique for Jews of the time period to predict the destruction of the temple. That alone tells you it's not crazy historically to think Jesus said, you know, I've been walking, going to the temple for years. God the Father doesn't want anything to do with it. It's lost its function. That's not crazy. Even if Jesus thinks he's God and he wasn't, he is crazy. It's not historically crazy to do that. On top of that, I actually believe Jesus wasn't just a dude. I don't think it was crazy. I think he had the capacity to think this really is going to happen. But if you assume he could not have predicted it, then, then this has to be written after the temple fell. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And the temple fell in AD 70. And so that's why scholars say Mark was probably written right after it happened. Because in Mark's gospel is where it first is recorded, that he says, not stone will be left upon another. And he gives some references that sound pretty specific. My, my response is, I think it's crazy to think that Jesus could not have predicted this for historical reasons because I think he wasn't just a dude. Secondly, the descriptions given here aren't that specific. It doesn't say when Rome comes down and sacks the city and insults the agriculture and kicks all the Jews out. That's what all happened. It doesn't get that kind of specifics. The closest we get to some real genuine specifics about the army surrounding the city is in Luke's gospel. That's possible that Luke was written after the fact because it's that specific. But I would still say it's not crazy to think that he says, 
or even Luke's version, they're going to surround the city. Guess what they did typically when they attacked cities in the ancient world? They surrounded the cities. I mean, this isn't... So, all that to say, if you get real honest, the reason why most scholars today put it in the 70s is because they think this could not have been a genuine prediction. Well, if you think it is a prediction, well, then all of a sudden the time, ooh, that changes things. Are you with me so far? I'm not trying to be insulting or too fast, but... John? I'm working on it. Okay. So, Jesus says, basically... Jesus basically said, the temple's going to be destroyed. Well, it really happened. So if you go, there's no way he could have known that. Well, then this has to have been written after it happened, because it did happen. If you go, well, what if he really did predict it? Well, then it means this doesn't matter at all. Most scholars do take this route, but typically, quote-unquote, conservative scholars, theologically, go a different route. And that's why I brought up way back when I started the study, I actually side with them, not because they're conservative, but because of the arguments. I think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written, John may be a little different. John may be a little different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written, I think, before the fall of the temple. And this is a common reason why I think that. One is because Acts, the book of Acts, ends with the Apostle Paul in house arrest in Rome. And later church tradition said he was beheaded under Nero. Paul probably died around the year 62. Let's say 64 to call it long term. Well, that's where Acts ends his document. A lot of scholars say, some, some scholars say, it ends there with Paul in house arrest, not beheaded, because he's not been beheaded yet. That Luke gets us as far as he knows. It, it cuts up to current history. Most scholars say, nope, don't find that compelling. Most scholars say Luke deliberately stopped it at the house arrest to prove a theological point. He's done. I don't find that compelling. I don't find that compelling. I think Luke ends the book of Acts with Paul in house arrest before he dies in 62 64. That means Acts was written no later than the 60s, right? Let's say around 80 60. Because Paul is still alive. We know he died about two years later. Well, if Acts was written then, we know Luke came before then. We know Luke and Acts were written as two volumes. We know that because the intro says in the first volume, there's a lot of reasons why. Well, Luke had to be written first. Well, you don't write a book overnight. Surely that took a couple years in the ancient world. So that puts the Gospel of Luke at least to say 58. Well, now we're pushed back in the 50s. And almost every scholar thinks Mark was written first, then Matthew, then Luke. So if Luke's around 58, Matthew, let's say 55, that puts Mark back in the 50s. Um... I find that quite reasonable, quite frankly. I think, I think it's quite reasonable. So if you're tracking with Samari, my David, who gives a rip? So here's the bottom line. The bottom line is, if you ever hear, and you will hear, and you'll read it in your Bible sometimes, Matthew was probably written in the mid-80s. The number one reason they think that is because of this, act, this prediction. If it was not a prediction, it had to have been written after it happened. If you have a different Bible that says it was written in the 50s or 60s, it's, it's because they, they take what, the route I take. Okay, I want to move on unless you have any questions or comments about that. Oh, furthermore, lastly, I think if the gospel writers really wanted to talk about the fall of the temple, they would have. I think they would have gone on and on and on. I think it is inconceivable that they didn't say a whole lot more about the destruction of the temple. Because other Jews of the time, when the temple fell, other Jews of the time argued that the fall of the temple was God's judgment on the Jews. Other Jews argued that, Josephus and some other Jewish authors. Christians did the same thing. For them, it was like, ha, 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 I told you so, you should have repented. And I've, that's not what you find in the Gospels. You don't find in the Gospels any kind of gloating or told you so or whatever. Some scholars say, David, yeah, they do. They predict, they act like it's predicted. I just don't, I think, I just think we'd have found a lot more ha, 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 but we don't. It, I mean, it's not very descriptive. It doesn't give a lot of details. Um, so I don't think, I think this happened. I think he predicted it. Okay, no questions, we'll move on. Verse three, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, Olivet Discourse, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the close of the age? Let me pause there very quickly because that one sentence clarifies a lot of nonsense people make up. In Mark's gospel, bless his heart, when Mark describes this event, 
He joins together two different things Jesus was talking about. One is the destruction of the temple. That's one thing Jesus is talking about. The second thing Jesus is talking about is his return. To use the word they did is parousia. Parousia. Temple, parousia. Temple, his return, or judgment day. These are two different things he's talking about. Mark's text blends Jesus' response and blends these two things together. Well, that's problematic because it sounds a little more confusing. It's also problematic because Jesus will say in a little while, this generation will not pass away before these things happen. And every skeptic atheist loves to go, ha, 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 he hasn't come back yet, he was wrong. Matthew makes it clear what Mark is a little bit not helpful one on in verse 3. The question is two-pronged. One, when will this be? What's the this? What's the this? Destruction of the temple, not stone left upon stone. When will the destruction of the temple happen? And secondly, what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? That's a different issue. They are not conflating the temple with the close of the age. And I might say more about this generation of pass away because I just had a correspondence the other day with an atheist or skeptic on my Twitter feed on that verse. So these are two different issues, and I think Matthew helps us understand better what Mark was also doing. He just didn't want he wouldn't as you know clear. <coughs> and Matthew and Luke do clean up Mark's Greek and narrative from time to time. I think he's done a good job here to help us understand it more. Verse four, and Jesus answered him. Watch out, take heed that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah. And they will lead many astray. And this happened in the ancient world. People came up to think they were, they were the Messiah. For example, the Samaritans. The actual Samaritans that don't get along with the Jews. Jews don't get along with Samaritans. They don't play well. They had a false prophet. So a guy thought he was a Messiah. They go out to Mount Gerizim and said these these buried sacred vessels Moses buried long ago are now going to be recovered and we're going to reclaim the kingdom. And what Pilate, Pilate sends out an army and kills them all. Well, there was a false messiah. So, like today, it's not crazy when you think of people who follow all kinds of wacky so-called spiritual leaders who go, God's given me a message, God's given me a word, he forms a community. Well, he's saying that kind of stuff happens. They're going to lead people astray. Verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, which they did all the time. But don't be alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of the birth pains. Way back when I did the class on Revelation, you should remember this little this chart, this uh, picture I drew all the time. If you'll remember, I said, in apocalyptic theology, time is divided. This is the present evil age. Does that ring a bell for you here? And things get worse and worse and worse and worse, and then boom, judgment day. Remember that? And I said that gets worse and worse and worse. This period right here, worse and worse and worse, uh, they say things like, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars, there's going to be pestilence. There's going to be death. There's going to be... And then it gets cosmic. The earthquake. Because that's, for them, that's cosmic. Because that's the whole earth shapes. Uh, the moon. The sun. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And these, all these bad things that happen as we're getting close to Judgment Day, they had different ways of metaphors of describing that. And one was birth pains. Like when a woman is about to give birth. That it starts hurting, it starts hurting. I'm getting closer to giving that baby. And that became an analogy that Jews use for the end of the times. It's like creation itself is going, it's coming. And he's saying, this is it. So what he says here, famines and earthquakes and bears, oh my, um, kind of, this standard Jewish apocalyptic thought that don't be fooled, that's going to happen. Listen, it's not a sign of Judgment Day. And that's how everybody reads it who doesn't know how to read the Bible well. John Hagee, 
All these people read that as the sign. He says, verse 8, all this is but the beginning. In other words, don't think these are signs. Look at the end of verse 6 one more time because you still don't believe me. This must take place, but the end is not what? It's not yet. So the disciples are asking for a sign that when the judgment day is going to happen, he says, look, all kinds of, it's going to look like hell's breaking loose, but these are not signs of judgment day. It's the beginning. Look at my little chart. It's just the beginning of the birth pains. <laughs> so don't get crazy. And of course, the church has used this, it's supposed to use this as encouragement. This stuff will happen. It will happen. Our mission doesn't stop. Don't sit back and stare at the stars and wait. No, 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 no. This is all the way it's going to unravel. Don't be distracted by wars and rumors of wars and all that stuff. It's not a sign of judgment day. But I'm saying this one more time. That's how you will always hear it on TVN, on the books, on the newsletter, whatever. Signs of the time. Oh, another war broke out. That goes, that goes precisely against what Jesus has just said. It's not the end. They're just signs of the birth pains. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. That is, they're going to want to persecute you and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That's... That's not very loving and encouraging. It does not fit well with the social gospel that tells you he wants you to be rich and wealthy and blessed. And he wants to give you, as Joel Osteen said on TV, he wants, God, God wants everyone to own a home. I heard him say that. Everyone to own a home. I don't know what to do with that kind of theology mixed with what Jesus actually says. You will be hated. You'll be hated. They will deliver you up. And guess what? That's exactly what happened in that generation. Verse 10. And then many will fall away. What that means is they will what we call apostatize. They will be my disciples, but they will stop being my disciples. Why? Because they've come under tribulation. Go back to Jesus' parable of the seed thrown on the soil. Some grows up and is scorched by the heat and shrivels away. And Jesus says... It's like when those receive the gospel and become a persecution don't last. Jesus is saying it's going to happen. Not every Christian who's persecuted is going to stay faithful. Some are going to say, I'm out of here. And again, there are all kinds of people, respectfully, in different denominations who think that once you're a Christian, you're always a Christian. It doesn't matter what you do. I don't know what to do with that with the teaching of Jesus when he explicitly says many will fall away. Not... And you were never saved in the first place. The assumption is they're disciples. But when they go through hell on earth, they go, I'm out of here. That's explicitly taught by Jesus in the New Testament. By the way, the book of Hebrews explicitly says in chapter 6 and in chapter 10 that those who have once tasted and left, they're in bad shape. John the Elder and John's Gospel, they're people who left our community. But they were not a part of us. Anyway, Jesus does not believe that once you put your faith in Jesus, you can never do otherwise. Jesus did not think that. In his own ministry, he saw people follow him and say, I'm out of here. In John 6, 66, then John 6 particularly, he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have a disciple. Well, that's crazy sounding in general, but certainly to a Jew. And it says, and many left him because these things were too hard. That is apostatizing. That's leaving, you might say, discipleship. And that's what he's saying. Also, the thing to indicate that also, I believe, running the race, being, uh, I don't know, I can't, put up, I can't come up with one right now. Yeah, the Apostle Paul. He said a lot of things that indicate that you could walk away from your faith. Yeah, that's the Apostle dying. Paul gives it. Yeah, that's right. He, Apostle Paul gives indication and that those who endure to the end. Yeah, the right. book of Revelation right. does as well. So we can say, I don't want to be a Christian. Let me say a quick thing about that. Because maybe you don't care, but those on the podcast will. Because this is, very, this is a common theological point out there. And it's called, on a, on a loose level, on a conversational level, this is called once saved, always saved. Or technically we call it the perseverance of the saints. And there are ver verses that people use to argue for that. I'm just to save time, I'm telling you, I don't find that compelling at all. Jesus did not believe, he says so explicitly, Jesus did not believe that if you're his disciple, you will automatically always stay his disciple. He did not believe that. 
That freaks people out when I say it a lot of times, maybe not you, but other people I've talked through the years. And the reason why is they're scared they're going to leave the faith. And the assumption is, I think when I've met people through the years, is that they think that sinning makes them all of a sudden, quote unquote, lose their salvation. You don't lose salvation like you lose your car keys. There's no expression anywhere in the Bible that says you can, quote, lose your salvation. That's nonsense. Salvation is not a thing you own that you might misplace. It is a decision you make to reorient your life toward Jesus. The analogy I give all the time, it's much more like saying, I chose to come over to the United States and become a citizen, and I was really a German, and I'd speak English, I'd start driving on the, the correct side of the road, I pay my taxes, I follow the Constitution, and one day I go, I don't do this anymore. You don't lose your citizenship. You have to renounce what it is, you have to go back home to another place. I start speaking German again. I don't pay taxes. I reject my citizenship. I burn it, tell the United States I no longer. That's a big deal. It's not like a, oh, what happened? That's how it is understood in the discipleship in the New Testament, seems to me. It's when a person says, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm out. I'm out. And it was a real challenge, a real problem. And so people can get away with that. Well, they were never Christians in the first place. I think that's insulting and ridiculous. I think people know when they're a disciple or not. There are whole websites, tons of websites dedicated to people who were Christians, even people who were clergy, ministers and so forth, who left the faith, and they bind, they bound together, and they write books, they do, they do tours and lectures, all kinds of stuff about why I left the faith. And most Christians say, well, they must have never been a Christian in the first place. I don't find that compelling. I don't. There are people who used to go and knock on doors and share the gospel. I could tell you, you may not know who they are, but the people, I just... I've known people right now who are prominent atheists and skeptics who went to conservative schools and, I mean, they would go and evangelize. One guy said he did that for years and years, and then after his deconversion, he went back and knocked on the doors and said, I was wrong, I should never have done that to you. He tried to deconvert him. Richard Dawkins, the atheist, is going on a tour in the U.S., I think in the U.S., other places, having deconversion baptisms for those who want to leave the faith. Jeez. So... We are deluded if we think that people don't, in fact, and cannot faith. And I think it matters so much because Christians don't come to grips with what Jesus said. We have got to be realistic about this. People leave the faith. They don't like it. It doesn't give them what they want. People leave. They've left this church. They leave church all the time because they don't want to hear the gospel. It's a real challenge for people. And it's a real challenge to hear the truth. And you and I are in the same boat. And Jesus' challenge and encouragement here is to us, too. Look what it says in verse 10. Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Why is that? Because they come in tribulation. People are handing them over for prison to kill them. And many false prophets will rise and lead many astray. That's a bad deal. Listen, sister and brother, it's a bad deal of all the New Testament. When you have false teaching and prof, false word from the Lord, you lead people away, it is bad. It gets people so angry today to talk about what Jesus said about everything, from sexuality to whatever ticks them off. And they just start 30 more churches down the road. But Jesus said those are false prophets. You don't hear a new word from the Lord. Jesus told us certain things about things in life. And when you have a different message than Jesus preached, you've become a false prophet, a false teacher. And they lead people astray. And it is in all of the New Testament. That's Man, it is bad news for a false teacher and prophet. So... It's a big deal to hear what Jesus said and not what some person says, I got a new word. Or he didn't really mean that. Verse 12, and because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. It's just going to go away. They're going to die away. It won't be popular to love them and stay faithful. But he who endures to the end will be saved. If everybody's saved no matter what they do, why didn't he just say that? He's trying to encourage people. You've got to stick in there when the tribulation comes. When people hate you and turn you in, and people turn in the place he says, brother against, you know, father against son, son against father. When that happens, don't give up. You've got to go all the way to the end, and that you'll be saved, meaning God the Father will vindicate you at judgment day. You can't give up. We can't give up. Ever. Ever. If it becomes illegal to talk about Jesus in the country. If every person you've ever known walks out on your life, if spouses divorce you, if we get beat up in the streets, Jesus says, those who endure to the end will be saved. Do not reject the faith. They're being used by evil. And these are just a sign of the beginning of the birth pains. 
Do not give up. And he's saying that because people, in fact, do give up. So sisters and brothers, hear it again. Don't do it. Don't give up. Verse 14. And this gospel must of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. He means Gentiles. That's what nations means. And then the end will come. So that is the gospel will proclaim. Some people take this, you might say, literally at face value and think this means when the gospel is preached to all people groups, and there's a whole lot of people groups that still haven't heard the gospel, and then it'll come. And so some missionaries say, we've got to preach to every nation group so it'll come back. Like Jesus going tick tock tick, so waiting, you know, maybe so, m maybe so. I don't read it that way. I think it's Jesus' way of saying the gospel is going to keep being proclaimed and there's going to be a time limit. And when time limit is up, he's going to return. But the gospel is first going to go out. I think in context, that's his point. The point is, it seems to me, and other interpreters, when rumors of wars and wars break out and nations and kingdom against earthquakes and famines and tribulation against you, don't stop being my disciple and don't stop preaching. That's verse 14. The gospel is going to go out. The kingdom of God is still working through the church. And when our testimony's done, time's up. But only God knows when our testimony is finished. So we keep proclaiming. He'll know when the testimony time is all up. He'll show up and say, good job. You've been preaching the gospel long enough. And verse 15 and following seems to me and many interpreters to be talking about the same event, the fall of the temple. So when you see this desolating sacrilege spoken of by the prophet Daniel, that's in Daniel chapter 9 and 11, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. I'm going to unpack that in a second. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let me pause there for a second. I don't want to spend too much time. I'm slowing my own self down too much, I probably. In Daniel's, the book of Daniel, Daniel speaks about this desolating sacrilege which most scholars, not all, but most scholars think refers to a specific historical event which precipitated what was called the Maccabean Revolt from about 165 B.C. to 163 B.C. Around 165 B.C., these foreigners came into town. I'm keeping this as simple as possible. Foreigner little bad guys came over and took over. And they weren't Romans, different group. And they slaughtered a pig inside the temple. And they call that the desolating, that is, it made it unclean, sacrilege, sacrilegious, unholiness. And so it rendered the temple unholy for some period of time. Well, that was bad. And then he had other local puppet priests do bad things too, and finally the Jews couldn't stand it. Um, Mattathias and his sons killed the priest on the altar, out where he, not the temple, but somewhere else. And then it started a guerrilla warfare. So... What Jesus is using that reference as a metaphor for what's going to happen in the future. That is, when the temple falls. So it's a metaphor from Daniel to talk about when the temple falls. And that's what happened. The Romans came and destroyed it and robbed the temple. That's what you always do. Temples were banks. So it had tons of money and gold and possessions. They robbed it, did all kinds of bad things. Verse 15, you, does this, the translation say, let the reader understand? Is that in parentheses? You see that? Yeah. The, in brackets or parentheses, that's a translation of an editor's. In, in Greek, there are no parentheses because there's no such thing as that in Greek. But the let the reader understand means not you as you're reading it, but the one who's reading it aloud. Because Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and all of them knew that when they wrote this, they would be reading this aloud to a congregation, most of whom cannot read or write. So when he says, let the reader understand, he's probably saying, like, wink, wink, make sure you understand the reference. Now, this might sound kind of weird, but in Mark's gospel, he doesn't say, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. But he still says, let the reader understand. So Matthew adds that, I spoken of in the prophet Daniel. <laughs> But he keeps the let the, prophet, let the reader understand. So quite frankly, I think Matthew didn't need both. <laughs> I think when Mark said it, the desolating sacrilege, let the reader understand, it's a way of saying you should know your Old Testament, your Daniel. But then Matthew makes that explicit. Are you with me? But he still keeps let the reader understand. 
to unpack it. But anyway, verse 16. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Listen, when persecution comes, run. Jesus never encourages us to run to martyrdom. He says, you can escape persecution. You can escape persecution. Run, go to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. So here's a bunch of examples of, you better get the heck out of Dodge. That's the, the point. And boy, alas, or it stinks for those who are with child and for those who are basically nursing their child in those days. The point is why? You've you got more to carry. You better be running fast. Pray that your flight may not be in the winter because it's very rainy season. Or on the Sabbath or Shabbat. Why? Because the Christians sure stand out. The Jews would just sit there. For then there will be great tribulation. Such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, never will be. And, and if those days have not been shortened, no human being will be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And it seems to me, it's a long subject too, elect always means corporate in the Bible. And he doesn't mean those whom God has saved from the beginning of the world. He just means people who are going to be saved. People who are going to be saved. If anyone says to you, look, the Messiah, there he is. Don't believe it. False messiahs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Lo, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness. Don't go out there. He's not out. That's not. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. Don't listen to that nonsense. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. The point being is it will be public. Everybody will know it. East to west. There's no secret messiahs in the secret wildernesses or the jungles to drink some horrible Kool-Aid. There's no secret places. God doesn't work that way. When the Son of Man comes back, it will be public enough to where it will be broad open. Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So he references some good Ezekiel. Now, now it seems to me and many interpreters He's still speaking of the destruction of the temple. This is where it's problematic. And I'll tell you why. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Powers of the heavens mean like many gods, with the lowercase g, the creature, spiritual creatures. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What's the sign of the Son of Man? We don't know. <laughs> Josephus said that when the temple fell, there was a, uh, a star that looked like a, a, um, a, well, like a cross, basically. Uh, no, I mean, not like a cross, like a, um, I can't think of the word right. I see it in my head. There was a particular sign that it was for a whole year after the temple fell. So we, we don't know what he's talking about. There's some image uh, that he's saying that you'll know. That, it, that is, it's important that the temple is being destroyed. It's judgment day on the temple. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, it seems to me, it seems to me that it's this last section. There's two ways to look at it. Let me say it this way. I'm trying to save time. Um, some people, some interpreters read verses 29 and following, sun being darkened, moon not give its light, stars, as just an apocalyptic metaphorical way of talking about the destruction of the temple. <coughs> If immediately that sounds kind of crazy, why would Jesus talk about the sun being dark? Why not just say, and then the temple is going to be destroyed? Why do that? Their response is because the prophets in the Bible did that stuff all the time. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, when they talked about the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon or by the Syrians, they didn't say, and then it's going to be, you're going to be killed. They gave these huge metaphors. It's kind of like sometimes we're exaggerative today if we said, you people talk about the eclipse that's coming up. This has been this amazing thing that ever seen your whole life I mean, it's going to change your world. If they went on and on and on, it's hyperbolic. 
It's a way of saying it's cosmic in the sense that God is judging them. That is one proper, it is a, it is a possible interpretation. It fits the ancient prophets very well. It makes sense of the context, and that is certainly possible. That he's still referencing the fall of the temple. Does that make sense so far? The other option that's always been a powerful option in the history of the church is that this is not about the fall of the temple, but Jesus' return. So it's the same apocalyptic imagery, but now it's about the Son of Man coming back. And when that happens, it's the end of, that's Judgment Day. I tend to lead towards that option, but I might be wrong too. I think, um, I think it's this one. And um, there are a lot of signs for me that that's the case. And I think verse 29 is trying to get us out there to say, um, immediately after the tribulation of those days. After the tribulation days. So all kinds of junk is going to happen. The temple is going to fall. False messiahs, false this, false this, false this. But after all that happens, it's different. That's when the Son of Man returns. But again, those are two major traditions, and I think they're both pretty compelling, but you get to, you know, whatever. Make up your own mind. So Jesus is still saying he is coming back. That's not just a metaphor. He really did think he's returning. Verse 32, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer's near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Most New Testament interpreters don't think Jesus was mistaken or duped or lying. Most New Testament interpreters think he's speaking of the fall of the temple. And that's precisely what happened. That generation did not die before the temple fell. It happened in their lifetime. Why is that? Well, one is it makes a whole lot of sense of the context. Well, that's basically the main nature. It makes, it makes no sense of the context. For example, look at verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. Now, why would Jesus just say, let's track me here. And when Jesus says this generation will not pass away, if he's talking about his return, why would he say in the very next, what we call verse, to say, but no one knows? Why would you say it's going to happen this generation, but then say no one knows? If you're talking about the same event, it's more likely to me that he's talking about two different events. One is the fall of the temple is not going to, it will happen in their generation. The second is, but on the return, when it's time to gather the elect, no one knows that's going to happen. That could be any generation. Even the son doesn't know that. Isn't that another case of converging? Past and future together. I think it is a great. I think it's a great example of merging past and future together. I think so too. If this interpretation is correct, and it's not bizarre, it's a very common one. I would have rather Matthew written it this way. <laughs> I would have much rather Matthew had written verses thirty-two to thirty-five after verse twenty-eight. I wish you would have kept it real nice and succinct. Let's talk about temple, 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 temple. This generation will not pass away, and then change gears. And then talk about Son of Man, Son of Man, verse 36. But no, no, that's going to happen. That, that's what I wish he had done. I think that is the best interpretation. And believe it or not, you make up your own mind, but most scholars think Matthew even cleaned up what Mark did. Mark even has a much more intertwined, much more, as you said, blended <laughs> between the past and the future. Verse uh, 36, no one knows. Verse 37, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Like life was sweet until it's time for judgment day. That's the point. They did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So it will be the coming of the Son of Man. The point is people will not be prepared. And Matthew will start giving us mult, I think five different parables after this of people not being prepared. And Jesus is saying that's, it's going to be like that. People aren't going to be ready for it. Now, why are they not prepared for it? Listen for a second. Why are they not ready for it? Because... Wars and rumors of wars and blah, blah, blah are not a sign of the end of time. There are no signs of that event. There are no signs for Judgment Day. You just got to be ready. You just got to be ready. There are signs that the temple is going to fall. Brother, people are going to hand in with each other, tribulation, people are going to fall away, false messiahs. Then you, and that's what happened. 
But Judgment Day, the return of the parousia, the coming, you know signs for that. The flood is going to happen. Verse 40 is one of the favorite verses of the entire church, and they're all wrong. Don't you love when I say that? Then two men, not women, will be in the field. That was kind of a joke. But two men in the field, one is taken and one is left. Woo! I'm about to start singing the song. Wish we'd all been ready. Two men, that's an old DC Talk song. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One is taken and one is left. Watch out for you do not know what day the Lord is coming. People say, woo, that's rapture. The only problem with that is they've missed completely the context. <laughs> when that happens in the ancient context, what he's referencing of Noah, it's bad. You don't want to be taken. That means you're killed. You want to stay. So people read this to think you want to be taken away. That's not his point at all. Well, go read your Noah story if you want. That's not the point is not that they want to be taken away. This is not rapture theology. There's no such rapture theology in the New Testament. This is not about being taken up. This is not about 1 Thessalonians 4 when he says the dead in Christ. Oh, that's 1 Corinthians 15. The dead in Christ will rise, and also in 1 Thessalonians 4. He's not talking about that right here. Here he's saying, you don't know what's going to happen. All of a sudden, one's going to be saved and one's not. But the ones in context, he means the ones who are sticking around. But the point is, verse 42, watch out. Because you don't know. There are no signs of the end times. All those books you hear about, all the TV evangelists, I'm telling you, I got it all figured out. I'm just encouraging you, Jesus didn't know. If he knows that person on TV, they might not be telling the truth. They might not know what they're talking about. If the Lord Jesus didn't know, I doubt anyone else does either. But know this, that if the householder had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he'd have watched and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And, of course, that's his point. Got to be ready. Just the other day, my brother-in-law's church was robbed. You know, stole a safe. It was just ridiculous. And I thought the same thing. If Had they known it was going to happen, you better believe they would have locked it and had someone on duty. And um, My wife's office, was when she was at a church in Houston one time, was robbed. They stole a laptop. They broke the window. Um, Lisa Ho, who works here, her house was robbed several months ago, while they were in the house, asleep. They came in, stole the TV, stole their car, and um, they got it back, which was good. So it's the scary stuff. In the ancient world, everyone knew that, I mean, it happened. People, were, people stole all the time back in the world like they do now. He's saying, you've got to watch out. Verse 45, he's about to give tons of parables about being ready. So I'm going to go pretty quickly because these are all very similar points. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing, that is, doing their job. That's the point. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with the drunken, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know will punish him and put him with the hypocrites. That is, hypocrites because they're, uh, in that sense, they're pretending to be something they're not. They're pretending to be a servant, but they're not. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. It always reminds me when I was a child, we were supposed to clean up before Mama got home, my mom and dad. And um, <laughs> in verse 48, my master is delayed. We said that often. They're late. That means more time to play. That means more time to go outside. But there are times... I didn't go beat up my brother. He beat me up. He did beat up his fellow servant. He beat me up. And he eat and drink with a drunken. Mine, this is getting too real. But anyway, he, um, but we would delay. We would pretend and play. And the point is, and all of a sudden they show up, you see the headlights on the driveway. And, oh my Lord! We run around cleaning the house crazy. Jesus says, it's like that. Don't be caught unawares. Be doing your job when he comes back. Verse chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be compared to ten maidens who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, this is a feast, and the still is. When you got married, you had the kiddushin, was uh, usually about an hour, I mean, about a year-long engagement betrothal process. And then you had the nisuin, that was the, the ceremony. The ceremony was when they took lamps to meet the groom, 
and then they would walk them back. It was a big festival, big brouhaha, especially if they were very wealthy. That could last about a week. But the point is, it usually happened to go get them to go back to a party. So this is about a wedding feast, and everybody knows wedding feasts are fun and awesome. And five of them were foolish, verse 2, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. They were prepared. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Back to that delay again, that delay. But at midnight, there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those maidens arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Hey, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. It's always the slackers. They were probably millennials. But the wise replied, Perhaps there will not be enough for us. I'm kidding. Not. Jesus loves millennials. But the wise replied, Perhaps there will be not enough for us and for you. Go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the marriage feast, and the door was stinking shut. Stinkins in the Greek, not really, but... See, that's the sermon title. What will you do with the delay? What do you do with the delay? Because that's Jesus' point right now. What do you do with the fact that it's 2017? He's still not back yet. What do you do with the delay? And in Matthew's context, their congregation was also waiting for that as well. He hadn't returned yet. What do you do with the delay? Do you sit around and wait to look for the signs of the time? Hey, did you hear about so-and-so here? Oh, I tell you today now... And the temptation is to retract from our mission of sharing the gospel because you're, quote, unquote, sharing, staring at the sky. When is he coming back? The other temptation to retract from our mission is when we're in the tribulation. People want to hurt us and make fun. They want to back off. And so Jesus is saying, what do you do with the delay? Those that are ready, when he comes, they're ready to go in the feast. Party time. Verse 11, the other maidens came out, hey, Lord, it means master, sir, owner, Open to us. But he said, truly I say to you, I don't know you. In other words, of course, it's too late. It's too late. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. It's too late. Yeah. Be doing I just finished a book not long ago, well, two books. One my dad recommended. He's been getting, he's on a big kick the last, well, I guess a few years, being a survivalist. And uh, he said, you got to read this book called One Second After. It's a book about an EMP blast, electromagnetic pulse, over the U.S., and it shorts out all the electricity. All of it's fried. And that's a real possibility. It's not like a, that's a real possibility. It's a nuke about, you know, several miles in the sky. That nuke doesn't blow up and kills birds, I guess, but the, the electric shock. And the book's called One Second After. What happens to the nation? And it is not a pretty picture. The guy a, has a Ph.D. in military history, so it's a... It became so well, he just wrote it on the fly. He, he teaches at a small liberal arts Christian school in North Carolina. And he said, I was looking around my chapel service one day and I thought, what would happen to all these students in here? They're all good kids. A lot of them are Christians, some of the younger kids, some of the military, some not. What would happen if we were thrust in that kind of condition? He said, I, I went over to the chapel that day and started writing the book. And he wrote it pretty quickly and it became almost immediately a New York Times bestseller. He said he was shocked by the success. There were senators, and there were people in Congress who said this should be absolute required reading of everybody in the government. But the book is called One Second After. You, you can't miss it if you look it up. And then he wrote one called One Year After. I just finished that one about a month ago, or a few weeks ago. And that happens, the laughter word. And then he wrote a third book, which I haven't read yet. Um, i got to get it. And um, it reminds me of the sense, of course, that book really hit home how much destruction something like that would happen. Tom Matherson. John Matherson, that's it, John Matherson, John Matherson. Thank you very much, Google. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, Cassidy. And um, John Matherson, anyway, the point being, it really stuck. I, I, I thought often sometimes about what Jesus said here. The point is, when that happens, it is way too late to think about it. And that became the actual literal response by senators and people. Um, he, there's a whole survivalist conventions now, and people who, bit, who dig all the pits and store up, Fresh water, 5,000 gallons, all the stuff. It's become very popular. He went to his first conference. He thought he was, he was just excited to show up. Thousands of people showed up. They were expecting like 100, 200, 300. And he was like this superstar, all because they read his book. And it really set into motion this whole survivalist movement. Because I'm telling you, it'll make you think, am I really ready if that happened? There is no, most people are not. They did that in the 50s when we thought the Russians were. That's right, they did. That's right, people got all survived up. And uh, so I think... Of course, this is not the same, but it's similar in the fact 
Jesus' point is, when the person knocks on the door, Lord, Lord, open it up. He's saying it's too late. I don't know you. Well, that's what it is with our own spiritual lives. And I'm going to move on very quickly to say, I'm still begging us all. I beg myself. Beg us. Beg us. Beg us. First Christian and every Christian who listens to this podcast. I know there are hundreds and hundreds of y'all. Be ready. It is so easy for us to stop feeling urgent. Churches squabble and argue and protest and waste so much time on nonsense when outside of our walls are people dying going to hell. We have lost the urgency. If we took this seriously, we'd not be so scared to talk to people about Jesus. We'd do everything we could to help them because it's coming. Verse 14, another parable. It will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents. Talenti, well this, it doesn't matter. This, this word of what he gives him, of a talent, uh, talenta, is actually a form of currency. So it's a lot of money. He doesn't mean he gave him a gift, a skill set. <laughs> like I, I think I have the talent of singing. I, I was natural and I got trained. I have a talent. That's not what he means here. He means money. But we'll go with that in a second. So he gave five, one he gave um, five talents, another two, another one, to each according to his ability. That is to deal with the money. How good are they with investing in money? Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. Ooh, good job. So also, he who had two talents made two talents more, and the told, um, he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hit his master's money. Like, I ain't about to blow my one chance. Now, after a long time, the master, of those hit, uh, hit, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, usually I made five talents here. I made five talents more. He said, Woo, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord or your master. And he also, the two had talents, the master delivered two talents, same thing, verse 23, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set your much into the joy of your Lord or your master. He who received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a harsh man, hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not winnow. The point is you had authority over everything. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I not winnowed. In other words, don't you know I rule over all my land? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. In other words, that was your job. You're my servant. I pay you to do that. You were my stockbroker. You didn't do your job. Verse 28, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Or to everyone who has will more be given. And he will have abundance, but from him who has not, even that he has will be taken away. That's just judgment. And cast the worthless servant to the outer darkness, there men will weep and gnash their teeth. And preacher and preacher and preacher and preacher and book after book after book will tell you this is Jesus' way of arguing for capitalism or investment in stock markets and blah, 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 blah. Most New Testament interpreters do not think that. This is not, Jesus is not giving us a lesson on the economy, economics. He's only giving us a lesson on one thing. You cannot, you cannot not do something for the kingdom of God because you're afraid. You can't. The servant's job in, con in ancient context was to do exactly what the other ones did. But because he had this perception of the master... He was afraid of Judgment Day, as it were, of, of the, rec the recompense. He said, you shouldn't have done that. Your job was to do what your job was. And there's going to be a payback for it. Jesus is not here saying we should have a stock market and whatever. Jesus was not a capitalist, as far as we can tell. I'm not against capitalism. I'm saying that's not the point. This is not economy 101. A lot of people also take this to be metaphorical. Oh, a talent means my skill set. So if you don't use your skill set for Jesus... He's going to take them all away. I also find that very uncompelling. The reason why is that's not how they use the word talent. That's how we use the word talent. Talent to them meant money. But we say now he's more a skill set. 
Well, see, that's called anachronism. We're reading back into the text a word. They don't use it that way. He didn't say a gift or a skill set or a spiritual gift. The point is, this guy was not faithful what he was supposed to be doing. The church is supposed to be faithful what it's supposed to be doing. We have a job to do. And if we don't do our job, we're called a worthless servant. There's another one, and this is one of the most mis I misinterpreted parables I've ever heard. I had a lot of fun tonight. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to pause for a second. We're going pretty fast because they're all, I think there's similar points over and over and over. Uh, do any questions or comments so far? Anything at all? Be encouraged when they tell you. Be prepared. Be prepared. Yeah. I, I, str I struggle with that sense of fear that people like to instill to get you to do it. But it would be good to have the money to do that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the thing about having money is if it's as bad as it could be, like the book One Second After, your money is worthless. Gold is worthless. You need to think, it takes us back to the early 19th century immediately. People then will want metal, they'll want bullets, they'll want guns, want clean, water. clean water. People will be barbaric instantaneously and they won't take your money for it. They'll trade supplies, they will go back to bartering system overnight. If nukes went off, we'd be bartering, bartering cows and people, gangs would rise up, they'd be murdering people, it'd be... People, oh, people are good natured. No, they are not. No, they, you are a lunatic. You're delusional if you think people are good at heart just by nature. Nope, you've never seen a person starve and put their family in danger. They will kill people in a heartbeat and steal your land and cows and don't care. Anyway, sorry. So not to scare you more, I don't think, I don't, because it's that's human nature. And gold won't save us, money won't save us. <laughs> it is good to discuss it. It's very good for us to discuss that. Um, yeah, my, my, my son has asked, Daddy, what would happen? We've chatted some about that book. What would you do if, um, I said, we'd bring a long trip to Granbury. That's where my dad lives. Because <laughs> he's got some, he knows how to do that. He loves how to, he doesn't live in a cave kind of thing, but he loves to look up how to make it. But like in the book, the Midwest does pretty well. The Midwest does. I thought, all right, I'm in the Midwest. That's pretty good. Because there are more farms, people can self-subsidize, they can make it on their own for a while, food and shelter, that kind of stuff. That always reminds me, my, my father-in-law grew up in Mississippi in the 30s, 40s, 50s. No, before then. Yeah, not 20s. I think he was born in the early 30s. Anyway, he, I remember saying, he remembers when the first car came through town, he remembers that. Um, it was a small town in Mississippi. And he said, I said, what about the Great Depression? How much did that affect your part of town? And he said, not at all. And I really goes, no, I mean, I didn't know anybody affected at all. And I remember this was years ago. I must have been, been married for 18 years. I mean, this must have been 17 years ago. But I had never thought about that. I'd always thought Great Depression affected every American there was. And I thought, of course not. Because if you live on a farm and you basically live your life without the extract, it didn't really affect you. But I thought, it's the same kind of stuff with this survival. The ones who are already basic, like, I'm sunk. I don't have a garden. I don't farm. I could do it if I needed to, but I don't know. I mean, and that, in the book, almost everybody, I mean, New York City, Florida, these places are wiped out immediately. Disease is rampant. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that's really American, depressing. and he says, and he's also a Christian, and he says, the hungry will come and the gatherers are going to be the survivors. That's right, hunters and gatherers. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. No more air, no more insulin, senior citizens, senior citizen homes. I mean, within a month, we will lose easily 50% of the world of the country's population. Gone. On that happy note, on the good news is, like Jesus is saying, those things won't save you. And the more we cling to it, sisters and brothers, the more we cling to gold and silver and whatever, we've lost the point. We can't cling to this stuff. We have a mission to do. That's so, how do I say this without sounding like I'm being whiny? One of the greatest struggles that as a, as a minister, pastor, I'm just a Christian brother, but certainly in my role, because I feel responsible for this, I do, a judgment day. One of the greatest struggles I have is trying to help and help people see that it is every Christian's job to make disciples. Jesus never said that pastors should make disciples, that evangelists should make disciples that preachers should make disciples. 
he said to his disciples, and all the early church did it. To varying degrees, not everyone had the spiritual gifts the same, but everybody had a sense of urgency, and it made the church blow up in size. And that's very difficult for me to convey that at all, because I can't make someone be convicted or make someone feel passionate. We need Christians being Christians wherever you are, from on the rooftops to, to nursing homes to hospitals to retirement homes. We need Christians being Christians everywhere because time's up. If we always acted like that and we took that seriously, we wouldn't be so worked up about politics and worked up about these. And it's just, we miss that. It's easy to get focused on holding on to the gold and silver and whatever and be worried about that. My dad can be asked to dad. Well, I'm anyway. glad that I mentioned that. Yeah. It takes me feel better. Good, good, good. I, I hope you do feel better. I mean, courage. If it comes down to that and it ever happened, my hope and prayer is that my first thing I would do, and I thought about this when I was reading the book, what would I do? Well, my hope first immediately was that the church would gather together. We'd have meetings and talk about what to do and how to help each other. We'd immediately try to help the people who are the sickest and poorest and don't have food and water. And all the people who do have it, we figure out who has the gardens, who has the farms. And I would have to walk from my house to the church. That's right. Well, we'd get the bikes out. We'd have bikes. We'd have to pick up a bike system and we'd start sequestering things and... Cassie would go get all the cigarettes and beer to make sure that um, they're used as currency. I'm, I'm, making, I'm just kidding. That's, but it'd be currency then. In the future, those who would smoke would be currency. To, I mean, I don't. I'd get all the, I'd use the currency. Um, but the church hopefully would act like the church. And then when we die, we die. Everyone dies. We don't like it when the timing happens, but we're all going to die. Just uh, So hopefully, let's, in the meantime, let's act like it's going to come. We'll love each other anyway. Okay, this next parable. Verse 31, when the Son of Man, of course that means Jesus, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, period. He is judge. He will act as judge. Before him will be gathered all the nations. Nations always means what we might call Gentile nations. It's the exact word used for it. That's us, all right, because I'm not a Jew. All nations, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. That's really easy for shepherds to do when they know their own flock. Sheep, 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 goat, goat, sheep, sheep, goat. It's easy, simple. In this analogy, everyone would have understood in that, that society. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, my goodness. He's going to separate us that easily. Sheep and the goats, and he will place the sheep at his right hand. And the right hand is always, in Judaism and the ancient world, a sign of strength and hope. Like Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Sorry if you left-handers. Are you left-handed? Right. You're right. Okay, I, I liked you. But the goats are at the left. Who's a left-hander? Are you my left-hander? Poor left-handers. Don't, they get a bad break. They just get a tough break. You know, notebooks are on the wrong side for them. The French word for left-handed is gauche. But in English, when we use that, it means... Um, <laughs> And maladroit, that is uh, so awkward, socially awkward, physically awkward, left-handed, bless their hearts. Lightness. My dad's left-handed. Huh? Sinister. Sinister, yeah. Sinister. Sinistry? Sinistry, I think it is. S-I-N-I-S-T-R-E. Is that it? Oh. Both hands? Huh? No, that's a different word. Yeah, that's Yeah, sinister. Yeah, sin a Yeah, a negative connotation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Bless her. Well, it's, it's not our fault they're goats. And he will place, just a joke, just a joke. But so she, the point is he's separating right and left. That's the point he's separating. Because Jesus can do that. Well, who's he think he is? That offends me. Well, you can when you're the moral master of the universe. Then the king will say to those of the right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That is, it's, you might say it's cosmic. He's always been ready for this. He's always known he's going to do this. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see the hungry? You hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink. And when did we see a stranger welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see the sick, you in sick in prison, and visit the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. 
Then he will say to those at the left hand, but let me pause it for a second, because that verse, verse 40, truly I say to you, you did at least these, my brethren, you did it to me, is always used in Christian marketing material and posters and commercials and TV and sermons and on and on and on, that Christians should go help the poor. The problem is virtually no New Testament interpreter thinks that. Well, I don't know of any. They might be out there. They don't think that at all. The, what Jesus is talking about here, based on what he said, is when he gathers all the sheep and goat and the Gentiles are there, some of the Gentile believers will make it because of how they treated, verse 40, my brethren. And so what he's probably talking about, it means, is his Jewish disciples. How you Gentiles treated them gives you a thumbs up, thumbs down. And you don't hear that preached ever, Marge, because that don't sound like the gospel. I thought they had to repent of their sins, put their faith in Jesus, and everything I say all the time. And that's why you don't hear that. This is the only parable I know of that breaks that mold. And that's why I think you'll never hear it preached, I think, correctly. Because it sure sounds like certain people get to make it to the kingdom of God just by how they treat a Christian. And the answer is, that's exactly what Jesus meant. Sure seems to me. Because the way you treat my brethren, my disciples, it's like you did it to me. Jesus assumes that the church, us, we represent the Messiah to the world. And our mission of sharing the gospel through tribulation, through hatred, through blah, 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 their response to our message is like the response to Jesus himself. The apostle Paul meets Jesus on the Damascus Road, and what, is, what does Jesus say to him? Remember? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul could turn right around and say, when did I persecute you? Probably never met him in his lifetime. Of course, Jesus persecuted me because you persecuted me, the person in my church. That's the body of Christ. Uh, earlier in chapter 10, Matthew talks about that. He talks about them, how you treat each other. Uh, uh, for example, he says, yeah, in Matthew 10, 40 and following, he says, don't forget this, he says in Matthew 10, 40, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who, he who receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man because he's a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Little ones are us. We're disciples. We're little ones or children. That's ex this, he says in two verses, 40, 41, and 42, three verses, sorry what this whole parable is about. How you respond to him, my little one. So does that mean Christians are not supposed to go help the thirsty and the poor in the prison? Well, no, but you need other Bible verses for that because this is not the Bible verse for it. Particularly, it's in the Old Testament. You're hard-pressed to find too many New Testament passages at all that say we're supposed to visit those who are naked, help them, those who are naked, those who are in prison or not. Here he's saying, when one of my disciples gets locked into prison because they're a Christian, or they're naked and poor. Listen to, that, listen to that imagery of a Christian. They're the humble. They're naked. They're poor. They're thirsty. They're hungry. Because why? Tribulation. They've been persecuted by the world. And the Gentiles, can, the, the pagans, they can respond to the faith or they can beat up the Christian. Jesus is saying, how you respond to them, I'm taking note of it. Sermon about <laughs> Well, good. Good. A amen. Yeah, I, I need a... Very briefly, it's a great question, great point. That is, there, you've been told that you can't earn your way to heaven, but passages in James that seem to suggest that. Yet, without, we could, only because of time, I'm going to go there. Yeah, James 3, and I think it's chapter 3, uh, but certainly it's in the book of James, where he says, you say you have faith, good for you, but basically you don't act like it. I'll show you my works to show you my faith, because work, faith without works is dead. It's a dead faith. What James is referring to are certain people in his community, particularly the wealthy, who are being shown partiality, and they are mistreating those who don't have their wealth. And it seems to be the case that that same group of people, or maybe a different group, are probably the same group. They are mistreating those who are poorer in their community, and that really bother them. Why? Because they believe, they have faith. 
And James is rebuking that. It is silly to say you're a disciple of Jesus and you have the faith that passed down to our fathers, but you mistreat your fellow member. It's impossible. So his point seems to be, it is to me, I'm convinced of it, James is not saying they earn anything. What he is saying is, if you have faith, you're going to show it. Like, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you show it, if you have faith and you show it, you'll see it. And that's absolutely good Bible. That's a common theological view. People oftentimes pit Paul against James. Say, Paul's all about grace. He says in Ephesians, it's not works lest anyone should boast. By grace you have been saved. And then read James. Sounds like they're all competing. They're not competing. They have two different contexts, and they're both talking about two different things. In Paul's context, there are people who are arguing and believing that works of the law, circumcision, Sabbath observance, these things help you get into the world to come. Paul says, uh-uh. Those things don't. Circumcision does not save you at all. James's community are people saying, I have faith, but they're not really acting like it. He's saying, no, you don't have faith if you don't act like it. There are two different things going on. A healthy tree will bear fruit. Yeah, that's what, yeah Jesus, said, fruit Jesus says in Matthew, a, 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 good fruit, a good tree bears good fruit. That's exactly right. So it's a demonstration. That's exactly right. That's what Jesus said. And I think that's the same point James is making. Yeah, a healthy or good tree will bear good fruit. And that's how, why, why Jesus is going to say in Matthew 18 about false prophets. You'll know them by their fruit. If their fruit or results or ethics, their behavior is spoiled, you'll know what kind of tree it is. I think the book of James, the author of James would say the same thing. If I meet a person who says, oh, I'm a Christian, I believe and believe and believe, but they're horrible, evil punks, or they're rude, or they're, I mean, they mistreat people, they're unjust. We have the full right to say, this looks to me like the tree's rotten. Well, who are you? I'm a Christian, and you'll know, you'll know whether a person acts like it or not. So there, he's not earning it. Nothing to earn. That's a great question. It really is a good question. There's nothing to earn there. Not in James's point. His point is, it is not enough to say I have faith, but not act like it. Good question. Good question. It really is a very good question. That's not the point. Well, sometimes we have guilt because we feel like we can't do enough. Right. Sometimes we have guilt because we feel like we can't do enough. That's exactly right. And the response to that is, the response to that of feeling guilty because you can't do enough is, you are right to feel guilty. Because you can't. You're a sinner. You can't do enough. That's right, you can't do enough. That induces guilt. It should. Guilt must be forgiven. That's the response to guilt that Jesus offers. Forgiveness. That's his response to guilt. Guilt is absolutely appropriate. People who don't feel guilty will not understand at all what the gospel is. They don't feel ashamed. They don't feel bad at all. They'll think, oh, I'm good. I'm a good person. Everybody, I uh, know, I'll start preaching. I have a Everybody thinks they're good. Everybody thinks they're good because everyone thinks they're not as bad as the ex person beside them. Everybody thinks that. You talk to any person in the world, Christian or non Christian, particularly the skeptic, especially the atheist, any person not a believer, rather. Well, I mean, I'm no Hitler. But even Christians will say that. So it's like God kind of saved them. I mean, I, I, mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, but I'm not that bad. They don't feel guilty. I think, I think if you don't feel guilty about who you really are, not as guilty as Hitler would feel, ideally. Sociopaths don't seem to feel guilt. But the point is, there comes a point, I've said in sermons, that really mature people really grasp that we're not that good. That if push comes to solve, too many times we're narcissistic, we're self-indulgent, we don't always say the right thing, do the right thing, and that should make us feel guilt. Because we are, <laughs> was it, who was it that said, is it, con I think it was Greg Kokel. Is it conceivable that the reason why human beings feel guilt is because we're guilty? <laughs> People always like, it's, is, it, is it the realm of possibility? Because that's what most people will not say. No, you feel guilty because your parents made you feel that way, society made you feel that way, it's not your fault, you've got unmet psychological needs. And he says, is it conceivable that humans across the board, across races, can feel guilty because they are? And the issue is, now what do I do with that guilt? The Christians have an answer. I'm going to go ahead. That's enough on that subject. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good. So, sister, you can't earn it. 
Here in this parable, it, I want to throw a big wrench into what I just said, but I didn't write the Bible. Jesus did not ask my opinion. This is the one parable I know of where it sounds like you can earn it. <laughs> it sounds like pagans can be super sweet to a Christian and then they make it. Well, that's possible. Jesus is Jesus and I'm not. He's a king and I'm not. I don't think that's the point. I think, I think if I ask Jesus face to face, did you really mean really that if an, if an atheist gives a Christian a cup of cold water or visits them in prison, they go, high five, you made it. Really? Maybe so. I think Jesus would say, that's not my point. My point is, if you, if you receive a disciple and take care of them, you are, listen, I think he's assuming, you're also assuming that that skeptic, that atheist, is receiving the disciple and the disciple's message. I concur. I think the New Testament teaches what you just said, which is, if a person doesn't come to Jesus, good works don't count. If God des decides to save a person, anybody in the world, the person in the African jungle to David Pendergrass, if he does, it is only because of the saving death of Jesus. The saving benefits are applied to people. The question is, what does it take to have those benefits apply to a person? And I did a bunch of podcasts on you. Listen to a podcast on what about those who've never heard the gospel? It's called The Fate of the Unevangelized. And it is just awesome. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to build it up. You all listen to it. It answers that question. But yes. So again, one more time. I think the assumption is these disciples are being the church and sharing the gospel. Some get a lot, get tribulation. They get beat up, hurt. It says that. They get beat up, hurt, killed. But if a pagan hears that message in context, you're going to beat them up or they're going to receive them and take care of them. I think the assumption is if they're taking care of them, they receive the message they have, which is what? You've got to believe in Jesus. So I think that's the point. I don't think it's just an issue of give him a cold water. I think he's making this an either-or proposition that today I don't face. I can go up the street, mass street, share the gospel. No one kills me. Probably not. Probably not. There's sometimes going to be just new, but this is, this is 2,000 years later. Things have changed. They've heard of this Jesus character. This last bit, uh, on verse 41, I'll say to those other hand, get away from me. To the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty you gave me no drink. So stranger you do not welcome me. Naked you do not clothe me. Sick and in prison you do not visit me. And he will also say, uh, also answer, Lord, when we see you hungry and thirsty and stranger and naked or sick or in prison and didn't serve you. He will answer him, truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Again, once again, Judgment. God is watching. That's Jesus' point. God the Father, God the Son, Spirit. They're watching our condition. When we're naked and hurt and bruised by sharing the gospel and we get persecuted, God is not oblivious to that. Those Christians over in Syria and other places all through the history of the church who have been martyred, killed because of their faith, he is not ignorant of what's going on. And those people who respond to the Christian faith and take them in and take them in apparently become disciples themselves, he's not ignorant of that either. He responds. He's well aware of how we're treated. And it seems to me overarching one more time with the beat of the drum. If Jesus, if there's one theme I think Matthew is saying is, you've got to be ready. Do not be deterred by wars, rumors of war. Don't be deterred by the destruction of the temple. Don't be deterred by speculation of the end time. Nope, not even the Son of Man knows. Don't even start looking at your clock. Instead, just be ready and keep proclaiming the gospel. Some are going to fall. Many will fall away. You've got to stay indoor to the end. Don't so get side. Eh, brother, we are distracted. I think Jesus' point is don't get distracted. Live like any moment. Any single moment. On that note, time's up. Now, any questions or comments from me? So here's my last pastoral encouragement, sister and brother, before I pray. Is there anything in your life that needs you need to get ready? What really is there? And it might not be anything. Is there anything at all that you're going, I know I ought to, but. I know I ought to, but. 
I know I ought to do better about that, but if you know you ought to, but you're sinning. I mean, basically, let's just, let's be real. Is there anything at all you think in life, I know I ought to, but I can do better? It doesn't mean overnight you become the saint you want to be, but it does mean you make your mind to say, I'm not going to wait anymore. There's an urgency about my life. Who needs to hear about Jesus? What family member, what friend, what colleague needs to hear now? At least get it off your chest to say, at least I did everything I could to tell them. Uh, that's the challenge before us. Are there any distractions? That's the challenge before us. And we're all in this together. Believe me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the ability to listen to your scripture one more time. To be able to study it, learn from it, to be both, well, I know, I'm terribly challenged and encouraged. I thank you for that. Thank you for reminding us not to get sidetracked and distracted. Help us not be led astray by false prophets, people who, I know God told me this, if it's anything different from what you have said explicitly in the Gospels, please help us, help us, please stay courageous in the face of social ostracization and maybe persecution. And it sounds silly to even say it when we live in this probably the safest country in the world, and yet we beg for safety all the time. So God, I'm asking for courage, not safety. For all of us, for all of your church, all around the world, that we not think of the consequences when we talk about the truth. We not think about what the fallout might be, or people might leave us or abandon us, or we might get persecuted. Help us just stay faithful. Help us not be distracted by the delay in your coming. Help us not think it doesn't matter and then we go bury our talent in the ground because we it doesn't matter. You're taking too long. What difference does it make? Please revive in every one of us, please, a sense of urgency that you tried to instill in your disciples in the first century. For our sisters and brothers in Christ who couldn't be here tonight, those who are listening on the podcast, Spirit, please, grant us your wisdom and courage in our decisions, our conversations. If all of us are worries and stressors, everything is burdening us down, please help us put those things down to run the race, unfettered by sin, by worry and stress. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray, amen.